It was one of those deals when you look back on it, you go, holy crap, I can't believe I lived through that. Same excuse they used in, you know, 2005. I had a gun pulled on me at least twice a year, every year I was an REO broker. What are the disadvantages to going fully virtual? I've said this before, I've never said it publicly. I do believe that there is a foreclosure boom coming. To be very honest, I will fire a client before I let them be abusive to a VA. I'm sorry. In this day and age, not everybody gets to live the American dream. Some people, really honestly, shouldn't buy a house. They can't afford it. On this interview, for the first time ever, I get to sit down with the CEO of Summit VA Solutions. He's never done a full form interview. You can't find it on the internet. He's got over 25 plus years experience in our industry, starting off as an REO broker, one of the largest in the country operating out of Houston. He gives me a comparison of what 2008 to today might look and feel like. Are some of these comparisons you're seeing on the internet accurate? He also gets into the virtual assistant world, what that should look like for you and what the agent post August 17th, the agent of change, should be focused on. Stacy st started his virtual assistant company not even for agents, not for himself. He started it for them. This is somebody who's passionate about people, who cares deeply about the people around him. And I'm really honored to be sharing all of his insights with you. I hope you enjoy. Let me know what you think in the comments. All right. For, first time we've ever done this, a cigar lounge interview. The BAM interviews are usually very buttoned up. I mean, we had Kevin Sears on earlier this year. So this is the first time we've done this. Nobody better to do it with than Stacy Sutter. <laughs> if you've seen Stacy at a you know conference or something, you see him typically with an unlit cigar. <laughs> we, we share a passion for cigars. And um, you know, I've interviewed a bunch of people. I mentioned Kevin Sears, uh, interviewed a bunch of people this year. Brian Serhant when he released the book, Sharon mm -hmm. Shravatsa, um, Mike Pappas, a whole bunch of these guys. And I think our conversation off camera in Orlando at the end of February was one mm -hmm. of my favorite conversations <laughs> of the year. And I said to you then, I said, I've got to have you on the pod. I've got to yep. have you on for a BAM interview because you've got so much knowledge in the industry. You've been doing this a long time. There's, I'm going to have you go through your history. Okay. Um, there's really, to me, it, a whole bunch of stuff you've done in the industry that a lot of people can learn from. Uh, before we do that, we're here at Wild Cigars in Burleson. Texas, yep. which is, I guess, I, I'm not familiar with all of Dallas, but this is Dallas area, right? This Would is you uh, south of Fort Worth. South of Fort Worth. Yeah. Um, you brought me a 15-year-old cigar. Uh, so, yeah. So for anybody- well, I've had it for 15 years. It's probably older than that. <laughs> okay. So, so for those that are like, okay, I'm going to check this interview out because I'm also interested in cigars. Mm -hmm. What's the deal with this one that I'm going to light up? So that is uh, the design- uh, by a cigar manufacturer maker named Sam Lucia. Um, somewhere around 2000, he was voted as the <laughs> number one uh, number one blender in America. He had uh, two cigars that came out that in that first batch: Lucia Black and Lucia White. Lucia White was a little light for me, so obviously the Lucia Black is a Maduro. Um, and uh, so that when I started smoking cigars, that's literally all I smoked. And then Sam went out of business. He had sold to American Cigar. He didn't, they didn't, he didn't like the way they were running his business. So he bought it back, ultimately went under. Owning a VA company and being an avid cigar smoker, I put two VAs on it. One on working the East Coast, one working the West Coast, moving to the middle. Um, and... Uh, literally bought every box I could find. They had my credit card and they would just call up and say, hey, do you have, how much would it cost to ship? Great, we'll take all four boxes or we'll take your one box or whatever it was. Stacy's CEO and owner of Summit <laughs> VA Solutions. So it's nice to have that advantage at your fingertips <laughs> yeah. when you come come up with a problem. Yeah, And, and we're going to get to there, obviously, but you've got a whole bunch of history and, and I want to go deep on it and then get some of your thoughts. I've got a bunch of questions. Sure. Um, to ask you. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and light up. 
And why don't you bring us back to, I think it was 99, you said you got into real estate. Yep. Um, what you, you were an agent first. Give us yep. a little bit of the background before sure. uh, we get into it. Oh, let's see. So I had worked uh, for DOJ, had come home from living in Japan for two years and had gone to work in a hotel managing a bar. Uh, you know, the funny part is, is I didn't even have a year, year's worth of sobriety under my belt at the time. <laughs> you shared that. By the way, Yeah. When you, I usually look everybody up, if, if they're well-known or not, I look uh -huh. what's fresh, rental, relevant. There's like no interviews, no, con you know, there's not a lot of content of you <laughs> online, except for what you've shared through Summit VA. And you've shared that in the past that right. um, you've been sober for many years now. Yeah, I've been sober. Uh, this year will be 26 years. Uh, November 15th is my birth is my AA birthday. All right. Well, yep. congratulations Thank on you. that. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, moved back to the States, moved in with my parents. I didn't have a home. Um, I didn't own anything. I'd been divorced twice and met a great gal who got off an airplane one day and said, Hey, you want to become my roommate? I'm moving to Bakersfield, California. And I said, sure. Why not? Um, so uh, her and I moved in together and they decided at the hotel I was working at that a recovering alcoholic should not be a bar manager. I'm like, well, you know, as long as I'm not sampling the product, <laughs> there's nobody that steals from a bar better than a, than a former bartender. You didn't have, you didn't have a concern, but you see, a, there's a lot of, in real estate, a lot of people right now are making that decision. Hey, I'm not going to touch alcohol ever again. Yeah. It's better for my life, whether you know, they would consider themselves recovering alcoholic or just better for them lives. You, yeah. would, you don't think you'd have the temptation? Oh, no. No. Um, At that I'm, point, you made a decision. Oh, yeah. When I when I decided to stop, I was done. Um, the, uh, so we, uh, so yeah, we moved in together, bought, a, bought our first condo. It was the first property either one of us had ever owned. By the way, Stacy, I, I don't think I've ever had something 20 years aged or 15. You've had it for 15 years. You can tell. I went like this earlier. <laughs> so anyone that knows cigars knows like the coloring on the wrappers is only, you only gain that with time. <laughs> only with time. Yeah, there's 37 more boxes of those on the top shelf from my walk-in humidor <laughs> in my office. Uh, but anyway, so um, I was looking around for something to do. I have always possessed the ability to sell snow to Eskimos in the dead of winter. And so um, I thought, okay, what, what, is the, what is the most expensive thing I could sell? Well, I don't have a biology degree, so medical products was out. Car salesmen wear really bad clothes. I mean, who wears check pants and a plaid shirt? <laughs> and so I thought, you know, real estate. I can sell real estate. I uh, went to work for a company out of Bakersfield, California, a very large independent called Watson Realty. Um, they had their own real estate school. They only took two rookies a year. They only offered school twice a year. Uh, the number one person in my class who would, they would have offered the job to had already signed with another brokerage. And so I was number two in my class. They offered me a job and through with some great mentors, a uh, lady by the name of Leslie Walters, uh, Ken Carter, who owns Watson Realty, and a very good friend named Bill Carlson, who was my mentor um, in how to sell HUD property. Um, between the three of them, they, they took this struggling young guy and in my first year of real estate sold $5 million worth of inventory. Um, the funny part was, is my average sales price was $112,000 and the city average was 110. Well, you were a unit mover, as I <laughs> yeah. like to call it. Do, do, I think a lot of people, maybe the majority of real estate agents, get into the business when they're at a turning point in life. I know for me, I'd gone bankrupt in real estate mm -hmm. when I was 19 to 21, and the only way I could get back in was to get back in on the sales side, right. and I was at a really it had to be a turning point for me. You know, it was yeah. kind of make or break. It sounds like for you and a lot of people, I think in the industry, you can share with us sure. in the comments, obviously, if that's your case. But I've just come across so many people that are like, I was at a certain point, I had to make a decision, I had to make a shift. Do you find that to be true? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. the, the shift for me was 
having left Japan, got out of the real, got out of the restaurant industry, um, was looking to make a move in life. You know, I had two failed marriages. I was now in recovery, and you know, the restaurant industry is a great industry, but it is a young man's game. It is not. I was pushing 33, 34 years old. So it was a, it was a nice transition. Um, I moved into Watson. I can remember their, their training was very simple. They put you in this very odd shaped room with the air conditioning set at about 62. They Tom Ferry a, style. Tom Ferry. Well, <laughs> I'm so old that Tom Ferry's father was my coach. Right. <laughs> That's a classic. Tom will appreciate that. Line. Oh yeah, he will. I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, so anyway, the counter came up to here on me, and you, no stools. You had to stand up, and literally, we would rip a page out of the phone book and just start cold calling. You had to make a thousand cold calls. There was no desk fee, but to get a desk, you had to make a thousand cold calls. And I don't know how many times somebody told me. You know, son, they ain't taking me out of here unless they put me in the big blue bag. I was like, oh my God. It's how a lot of agents leave the business. Yeah. Like not in the blue bag, but yeah, <laughs> they, they just go till they stop. Yeah, until they just end it. Yeah. So, you know, went through that year, did $5 million. Wife came home one day, said uh, the company she worked for, Halliburton, dun, 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 uh, was moving us back to Houston. I had grown up here and uh, had left in 87 and said, I'll never be back. Um, you know, I watched my parents in the oil industry for years, grew up. If they've drilled for oil in the continental United States, I'd probably live there. Wow. Um, so I was one year in the business and I was going to start over again at ground zero. And you had just had a really great, and I strong just, year. Oh, yeah. For, for I had just won in. Rookie of the Year. And that was 99. You said. That was 99. Okay. So I moved. To, we moved to Houston in 2000. So you're, you're into Houston before the real estate run-up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Way in. I was way in. Um, my friend Bill Carlson was concerned that I would uh, probably starve to death. Uh, so he, he would never teach anybody how to do HUD sales. There were only two people in Bakersfield who did HUD sales. And he, he was as crazy as they come. You know, you'd go to him and say, hey, could you help me with this? No. You can give me the client and I'll give you a 20% referral fee, but I'm not teaching you how to do it. So you learned HUD before HUD, like no, having that knowledge in, yeah. in 8, 9, 10 was very valuable. Oh, yeah. You learned HUD in the early 2000s. I learned, I learned HUD in 99. Because everybody who knew it, you know, early. Yeah. Did Probably, I don't think you saw in 99 or 2000 that, or 2001, or maybe two by then, maybe maybe you started seeing it, but you didn't see it as like, oh, I'm planning ahead for five years because I'm having an explosion of business. You just had a connection and you got yeah, into it. Yeah, um, you know, my career in real estate has been um, a lot of being in the right place at the right time and being able to work really hard. Um, Bill let me work in his office. My wife had already moved to Houston. Um, and I was there to sell our house or our condo. And, um, Bill said, you can work in my office. I'm going to teach you how I'm afraid you're going to starve to death. Bill had also come out of the real estate industry or out of the uh, restaurant industry. Okay. So like, like many. Yeah. And you know, he and I were friends. We were the first one in the office every morning. We'd make coffee. We'd sit outside, smoke, have coffee. And, you know, by the time eight o'clock rolled around, we were ready to roll. And, you know, most of the agents were still thinking about coming in. So <laughs> he said, you can work in my office and I'm going to pay you 0.0% and you're literally going to do everything. <laughs> I said, okay, knowing it was only for a short period of time. Uh, typically, those are the best deals, mm -hmm. right? If I'm going to give you 100% of everything, that means it's everything you kill, you're not maybe learning in a lot mm -hmm. of those situations where if you get a great mentor and that's the deal they give you, oftentimes you want to take it. Oh yeah. And I absolutely did. I did. I was still doing my own sales, closing out what files I had and then worked for Bill, you know, 99% of the time. And it was the best education. You know, it ultimately took four months to sell it, sell our property, ended up moving to Houston. And when I got there, I knew no one. I mean, I had gone to school in the Woodlands. I hadn't been in Houston in 
you know, close to 10 years. So I knew nobody and I was moving into a major metropolitan city. I had interviewed with a couple of offices and they told me I wasn't sophisticated enough to work in their office because I sold HUD property. Um, I billed myself as the HUD king of Houston. And when I started out, the only advertising I did was like a three inch line in the classified section that said Houston HUD homes, and it would list all the HUD property um, that we had available for that coming week. And on a given week before, before the blow before up, what, the would you have? what would you have? 15, 20, 25 properties. For, for the whole city of Houston. Yeah, but yeah, and that would cover the whole city. And obviously I put the most expensive ones in, but you know, 29,000, you gotta remember back then, HUD was still paying 5%. So a $29,000 property was still, you still made money on it. Um, and you'd sell that off to investors. So I had a big pool of investors after about a year and a half. I had a pool of folks that were trying to get into HUD property because it was cheap and economical. And Some um, startup investors. Yeah, some startups and you know, a lot of hand-holding, a lot of explaining that you're not gonna win the bid every time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and at the same time, there was a guy in my office named Ed Burr, and Ed owned a REO company. And I had no idea what the hell REO was. Ed was segregated from the rest of the office. He had his own suite of offices. He had two assistants. He had a receptionist. And he had Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Wells, Bank of America. Um, <clears throat> And he and I had talked back and forth because I sold HUD and he didn't have the HUD contract. And so he and I had talked back and forth and our businesses never really crossed. So we're chatting. He comes to me one day and he said, uh, hey, how would you like to learn about foreclosures and REO property? And I was like, well, first off, what does REO stand for? I don't even know. And he said, well, it stands for real estate owned. Now, you want scary in, in our world, and we're all, we talk about being, you know, just X percentage away from knowing each other. The first house I sold in Bakersfield, California, Ed Burr under Freddie Mac was the listing broker in Bakersfield, California for the first property I ever sold. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, it was uh, about a $58,000 townhouse. Really, it's a very small, it's an industry that makes a big impact, obviously, yeah. Yeah. on our country yeah. and on all of our citizens, but a very small community within the industry. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's what I've come to learn. You know, it's... Um, it, it's small, but it still sometimes feels big because there's going to be people listening to this interview right now that are like, man, a guy like Stacy Sutter's got all this experience and I've never had the pleasure of, you know listening to his story, mm -hmm. listening to his experiences. And so you still can find, like I consider this interview and, you know, an untapped gem of an interview <laughs> because not too many people have done it. Yeah, I, you know, I can say nobody's done it. <laughs> you would be the first. Well, it's, it's an honor. Uh, my privilege. So, so let's let's move into so getting closer to the, to the REOs. crash. Sure. Yeah. Um, Ed was getting out of the business, came to me finally one day and said, hey, I'm retiring, I've had enough. Do you want to buy my business? I said, sure, I'll buy it. Okay, I want $1 million. What year was this? That would be uh, 2001. 2001, so th this is, it's a little early, mm -hmm. but it is like buying, you know. It was, we were on the It's fringe. like buying .ai domains, you yeah. know, 15 years ago. Yeah, it was, it was, on, the, it was on the verge we hadn't really seen it start to pick up yet, um, but we were we were getting close. Um, you guys could probably feel it before anybody else. Yeah. When did you know? <sighs> probably about 2004, 2005. Beginning. You were you were sure. Yeah. 2004, the year I bought that first of three houses <laughs> that moved me bankrupt. By the way. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> um, you know, I ultimately the deal with Ed. He, we, we got down to literally the day he was getting ready to call Freddie Mac and he had put me in front in charge of the Freddie Mac account. And that's all I dealt with because he didn't like the asset manager and the regional manager for it. Um, she liked me. We worked a deal in the 13th hour. He wanted I, a million, what'd you pay? 
I paid um, no money down. I bought all of his signs, all of his lock boxes. I paid him 40% of all of my commissions on the Freddie Mac account for the first year, 30% the second year, and then years four and five, I paid him 20%. You did a step down exit plan. Yeah, um, which really worked out well for him. It was great for me because I, I had no money. I mean, literally I was working from deal to deal. Um, did know. he end up with more than a million over time? He probably got pretty close because yeah. in those four years, his average allotment from Freddie Mac, um, when I took the account, was three to four properties a month, which was a lot in Houston. And keep in mind, at the time, there were only five or six REO brokers in the entire Houston Metroplex, okay. and we all knew each other. And the way it worked was... If you, if you were in North Houston and I was in South Houston, your asset manager said, hey, I've got this piece of property in South Houston to move. Do you want it? No, no. <laughs> that's, I live in a city that's 500 square miles, just the city of Houston itself. Yeah. So we would refer it. No, I've got this buddy, though, down on, in South Houston. Go talk to him. Here's his phone number and name. And then all of a sudden, now you've got the Fannie Mae account. All of a sudden, you've got the Wells Fargo account. Um, and then I went after him pretty aggressively. You guys were trading, <clears throat> helping each other with accounts, yeah. collaborating. And right, because between the five of us, I mean, we're talking a huge area. Yeah. I mean, in my first year as an REO broker, I put 100,000 100, miles on my pickup truck. Well, it wasn't set up that way. It just kind of happened where there was five of you in certain geographical yeah. areas and you guys used, yeah. used uh, your network to help each other help out. Help each other out. Because, you know, I don't really want to drive 75 miles to look at a property once a week and go, yep, it's still there. <laughs> they haven't, hasn't burnt down, hey, hasn't for, been vandalized. For those maybe, you know, there's going to be people listening to this pod that got in in 2020. There's going to be ton, tons of people that have been in a long time as well. Yeah. But for those that maybe are like, Ariel, what, you know, what's, you know, don't even really see that happening because we don't see it right now. I want to get into that a little bit later. But sure. Yeah, there's different requirements with REO. You got to oh, yeah. check on the property. Sometimes you got to spend money out of your own pocket. To, oh, you do on every property. On every property, right? You have to pay all the gas, all the electric, all the water bills. Um, you have to front the money for trash outs. You have to front the money for deposits. Collect. You You're like a tenant money. without living there. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if that makes any in sense. the boom, it was not uncommon to have $100,000 a month floating out there. Um, it was... You know, it's, some days I just wake up and, <laughs> and just in a wet sweat going, oh, my God, where's all the money? Um, but, you know, in the end, we ended up growing that by 2005. Um, I had become Freddie Mac's training broker for Houston. Um, I had the Fannie Mae account. I had all the large banks. I had a ton of little banks. We had 57 different banks going into 2005. Um then as, then as it ramped up, it, it ramped up very, very quickly for us. Um, you know, it was, it was one of those deals when you look back on it, you go, holy crap, I can't believe I lived through that. But, you know, I had a great staff in office and I literally initially did all my own field work. You know, I was the one that posted the notice on your house and knocked on the door and explained what cash for keys was and Sorry, it, you know, you're, you don't live here anymore. Um, you hard know, conversations. I, yeah, the hard conversations. And, you know, people would tell me, I really appreciate it. You treated me with respect. You've been courteous. You've been kind. And I can be a really nice guy. I mean, I really, truly can. But as soon as you become a jerk, then it goes, then it escalates over the top. Um, and... We're talking Texas, so. We're talking Texas, so, you know. <laughs> Escalation I'm, I'm, is usually bigger. Yeah, I'm five foot eight and 170 pounds, and uh, I don't put the fear of God into too many people, <laughs> but that 45 Kimber that I carry on my right hip sure does. You just kind of pull your jacket back and go, really, you're not gonna leave? You really wanna hit me? <laughs> oh boy. Oh yeah, I mean, my deal with my wife was is that uh, uh, every day, I had to come home every night. And she's probably going to hear this. And I know I never told you. I had a gun pulled on me at least twice a year, every year I was an REO wow. broker. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Maybe not the REO brokers in Connecticut, but in Texas, that, yeah, that's we, probably Yeah, we do more things common. a little differently. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have the law, you know, where you have to, where it takes you 90 days to get them out of the house. You um, have to move a little faster. Yeah, we, we had 30 days, and with Freddie Mac, they wanted you moving faster than that. So it was not, it was not uncommon, you know, if you had a vacant house that maybe squatters were in. Uh, that you go by at six o'clock at night, you kick in the back door, you chamber around in your 12 gauge shotgun and go, if there's anybody in here in the next 30 seconds, I will shoot you. <laughs> this is not uh, the type of work in real estate that they make Bravo uh, or Netflix shows about. No. This is, but Ario's foreclosure, foreclosed properties is a, I don't think a lot of people understand this fully, but it's a healthy percentage Mm -hmm. of the market, of the real estate market. Oh, yeah. I think that's how you explained it to me in Orlando yeah. as well, where there's a certain number that is, you know, wh where we got to in, you know, end of 2021, where it was zero, basically, right. was unhealthy. Right. A certain amount of these is healthy for the market. Sure. There's always, there should always be about anywhere from eight to 10% of the market that is running around that REO or that short sale end of the of the deal. Modifying loan, short sale, going yeah. REO, like the whole collection, the yeah. whole bundle. Exactly. And the reason is, is that's where you keep the investors. The investors buy that stuff. It's stuff that the average homeowner, one, probably doesn't have the money to repair, doesn't know about a 401k or a... Uh, what is the FHA repair loan now? Uh, the 203K loan. 203K. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 401 is a retirement well, Agents plan. don't know about 401K. We don't either. know about those either. You're right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, they don't know about that. They're looking at a house that, you know, needs to be completely gutted, maybe in an iffy sort of neighborhood. And, and that's where you push your investors to. And they're great properties, and they'll go in, and they help to raise the value of the neighborhood. And that's where the value comes in. Um on the flip side, you know, this whole corporate takeover of, of the residential rental market is concerning. Um, you know, they're, they're pushing smaller investors out of, the, out of that market um, because they can offer more, because they don't need to make. It's like being an REO broker. You don't make a lot of money on one house. You make a little bit of money on a lot of houses. And that's what these big corporations are doing. So they can pay almost retail or even sometimes above retail, and then turn around. They only need to make this much on that property for it to be profitable. Because they're for working them. on scale. They're working on scale, and and at the same time, pushing pushing American investors out of the market, which is reducing the amount of wealth that there's that possibility to create. M most investment properties, there's the there's a a number that keeps getting floated around X, tw you know, formerly Twitter, that mm -hmm. you know people think that institutional investors own 40, 50 percent of all the homes, which is not true. No, more of the investment homes still today are the mom and pop investor, but it sounds like you're concerned that they're going to keep losing their percentage of investment single families in particular. Yes, um, I was broker of record for a very, very large very large uh, property management holding company um, that just began liquidating here in, in the Texas market. Um, it was all rentals. They bought them all during the uh, REO boom. And uh, at one point I had close to 23,000 homes in Texas under my license. Wow. Yeah. Thank goodness I did not have to manage their company. They had their own teams and all. I was just the broker of record. Okay. So I got named on all the lawsuits, but other than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a lot. Uh, surprisingly, it wasn't. No? No, they did a pretty good job. I mean, you consider that many properties and yeah. no. If, I probably got sued five times in 10 years. Okay, that's a surprise. Yeah, it really was. Um, but, you know, once again, it's one of those things you can do if you have a broker's license that, you know, they paid me and I never even, I, they had an office in Houston that I went to three times in 10 years. I have no idea. It's wow. broker for hire.
So the REO company, what, when did you get out? Because you that was your big exit in yeah. in uh, your real estate career when you exited out of REO. You did it a little differently than the guy that you bought it from. You didn't do a step down plan. No, I didn't. Um, it literally went from inventory to zero inventory. So you were in all the way through. I went all the way. I took the whole ride. Took the whole thing. Yeah. Um, what was the peak of you know like listings in your uh, you know, that you had uh, oh, a scenario at the, broker. At, at the height? Which was the height in Houston? Was it seven, eight, nine, ten? Where was the height? Probably eight, nine, or ten, one of those years? You mean, oh, the year? Yeah. Oh, uh, probably 10, 11, or 12. 10, 11, or 12. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we, uh, yeah, at one point I had uh, 200 and, 220, oh, sorry, 320 sales in a year and had another 200 properties um, in that were pending. Mm -hmm. And in pending, not pending sale, pending coming to the market. With REOs, you have to go through the whole, you know, eviction, trash out. Uh, with Freddie and Fannie, they were renovating some of the properties. They weren't renovating other ones. So you had to go in and do a market analysis and yeah. do a whole, that whole process. Um, another 200 sitting there. So, you know, at one point I had, I was making the water, gas and electric bills on 500 properties. Wow. Yeah. And you know, it, it correlates the end of the, the end of the market exactly correlates with the uh, tropical storm Harvey that hit Houston and flooded it. Um, that was, that was the day I've said, that's it. I'm done. What year was Harvey? I'm trying to think when that was. Um, Bobby can look at fact check us. Yes, fact check us, Bobby. <laughs> on Harvey. So that was the year you sold. Yeah, that, that was the year. Well, I never sold it. I still own the company. You still own it? Yeah. Okay. I, so I thought you had an, I, so I apologize. I thought you had an exit and sold. No, no, no. Okay. I still, I own, still own uh, big city properties. The you company. Do. Yep. I just don't own any accounts anymore. I, like I said, I literally wrote it all the way to the end of the end of the ride. Your exit plan was, I'm just going to squeeze every bit. I'm sure you got yeah. offers for during that time for, oh, yeah. the, for the brokerage. Yeah. Um, and at the time I was, uh, I was a broker associate working out of a Keller Williams office out of Katy, Texas. And so, yeah, they, uh, it, you know, I got to the end and it was like, that's it. 2017. 2017. There you go. Okay. That was 2017 was the end of end of the road. Okay. Um, and uh, my last account was the VA REO account, the Veterans Administration REO account. And uh, it's like, nope, that's it, I'm done. Lady asked me to come over and change a light bulb in a house that the VA had given her to live in. I was like, no, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> that All was... the way across the city, because you can't change a light bulb, nah, I'm done. <laughs> Spent a year just kind of rambling around, opened a property management company, changed brokerages, went to Berkshire Hathaway. Spent a year there, like I said, did their prop, opened their property management company. And uh, I had two assistants um, from, the, from my REO days, uh, Bernadette Canero and Cecile Animus. Um, Both names I know because of my years <laughs> you with, us. with Summit VA. Yep. Um, Bernadette is now our chief operations officer. At the time, she was my ops manager at Big City. She started out as my executive assistant. She holds a degree in industrial engineering and uh, really a sharp gal. I mean, she uh, she's an insomniac, so her work in 18-hour days, seven days a week, doesn't bother her at all. I mean, she lives, she lives to make sure everything's perfect. Um, Cecile Animus was one of the very first VAs I ever hired. And honestly, I treated them like mushrooms. I kept them in the dark. Every now and then I'd kick open the door, throw shit at them, slam the door shut and expect results. So, so you were the agent that most agents, when they hire a virtual assistant, because they know they need help, mm -hmm. uh, they know they want to take their business to another level. And so they'll go and they've heard maybe they need an assistant or they just naturally know yeah. they maybe hire a virtual assistant you were that bad agent who didn't really have a way to onboard a virtual assistant, integrate them into your work, train them. <laughs> you were just like expecting them to know everything day one, it sounds like. Er, kind of. <laughs> I didn't know what SOP stood for. Okay. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, I mean, it was horrible. Um, and Bernadette and the VAs got together. I had I'd fire, I hired five people one day. I'll take these five. <laughs> sure. I don't know what we're going to do with them, but, you know, the banks were asking for more and more information and more and more detailed reports and more and more paperwork. And they were cutting commissions and the work level was going up and I had to find a way to make it profitable. Um, and I had an in-office team as well as an out-of-office, as well as my VA team. And ultimately they began working together. And over time, uh, the girls in the office eventually um, worked their way out of a job and went on to do other things. And um, I was left with an entire VA team. So the last five years in the real estate world, my office was completely ran by, uh, by virtual assistants. So from like 12 to 17 was yeah. completely virtual All assistants, virtuals. which is, I would say very much ahead of its time in real estate. Oh yeah. Not many people were doing that. No, I had a couple of friends that owned a VA company out of California and, and I was their biggest client. And, you know, it, it, they were flying by the seat of their pants and so was I. Okay. And Bernadette came in and being an industrial engineer, she set up SOPs, the SOP manual for big city properties, my real estate company. It's 337 pages long. I would never have to teach you anything. You could literally <laughs> sit down in front of a computer and enter enter something into MLS, a contract, whatever. Well, you could upload that into ChatGPT now and, mm -hmm. and have GPT teach it to you. No. <laughs> you could. <laughs> no, we don't want to do that. We want you to have a virtual assistant do that for you. <laughs> well, your VA could do that and, and, yeah. and make that process easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's, uh, that's how they came in. So we spent a year together. Um, Basically, I paid them to be my friends. We did a property management to get company together and you know, did some oddball deals here and there. We were sitting around one day and said, you know, we, all right, I'm ready to go back to work now. Because literally, I'd, I'd been going 15 years straight. You know, once a year, I'd take a week's vacation, and that was it. Otherwise, I was on the road six days a week. And uh, took the year off, kind of played around. We opened Summit, um, opened the company literally with $6,000. And I think you said you opened it on April, April Fool's. Fool's Day. I saw that Yep, on April. one of your Facebook videos. Yep. Um, it's funny because when I opened my brokerage, Big City Properties, the state of Texas incorporated us on April Fool's Day. And then when we opened Summit, the state of Texas again incorporated us on April Fool's Day. <laughs> so it's like, hey, there's our birthday. It's easy to remember. So this was 2018 or, or yeah. this 2018 Summit yeah, VA? Was, yeah, somewhere around there. Um, we opened it up. Um, you know, I was scared to death, figured we were going to all starve to death. Um, made sure the girls got paid. Some days I got a paycheck, sometimes I didn't. It was okay. I made plenty of money as an REO broker. Um, and then ultimately, um, we had a client within the first 30 days we were open, you know, and it, and it literally just grew, you know, we went from like three to like six to like 12 to like 18, you know, well, when something works in this industry, you know, brokers, team leaders, they all talk. And I, I probably was one of your, you're one of the first, first clients yeah. because Doug Edrington, Yep. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, I went and visited his office opening, which feels to me like it would have been 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. So it must have been shortly after you launched, maybe within a year or so. Yeah. Yeah. And you were in within that first year. Within the first year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in, in uh, yep. April to April of 18 to 19, yep. Doug was like, Doug put on the screen. I remember sitting in, in his brand new office, which he still has today. Shout out to Doug. And he brought a couple of his VAs that were Summit VAs mm -hmm. on the screen. And um, he didn't do any talking. He said, hey, guys, what are you doing? How are you doing it? How are you making us better? How are you you know, making us grow faster? They were on like lead accounts and that kind of mm -hmm. thing for him. And it was fascinating. I remember a bunch of us that were there were just kind of looking around like, <laughs> 
what? What's going on here? This this seems like an opportunity. They're in the Philippines. Where's that? Yeah, and so 100% of your VAs are in the Philippines. 100% of my 100% of my whole team is in the Philippines. Oh, 100% of your team. I'm the only one. I'm the only employee in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> and and that was ahead of its time too because really most people didn't go virtual work mm-hmm. until COVID. Yeah. Um but it was for us, it was like an opportunity of this is how we can grow faster, so we can get great people. Because the more I learned mm-hmm. about Summit VA and got my operations manager, Carolina, who you know, yep. to take a deeper look, um, we, we came to the realization very quickly that, wow, we can get great, hardworking people through this company. Mm-hmm. I think I'll give a shout out to TC Lee and, <laughs> and Joe and Renz. They've been, I mean, TC Lee. The, one of our most senior people with our company, mm-hmm. um, the real estate company, already had a, a guy named Lee. He's still with us today. He runs ISA. <laughs> and so when we hired Lee, who's one of our TCs from VA, mm-hmm. we had to give her a name. We're like, you know, he doesn't want to give up his name. So we, <laughs> we call her TC Lee and it's stuck to this day. But yeah, she's probably been with us six years or something like that. Yeah. And, and uh, Joe, who, who does a lot of work with BAM, a lot of the videos you see on the BAM could be edited or, or some of the clips by Joe. I mean, he's one of the great video editors in the industry and he lives in the Philippines. Yep. Um, it is amazing the skill set that you can find. It is. Um, All Most VAs are highly educated, uh, more education than I have. Definitely more than I have. Yeah, I have. I don't have a degree, so I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every VA I've interviewed has a degree. Yeah, well, you have to remember that po- that the way out of poverty in the Philippines is education, and you know the the VA their families. I mean, it may be take aunts and uncles and moms and dads and brothers and sisters to put a, put a kid through school, but when they get graduated and they go find a job then they help to put the next kid through school. Um, Philippines is actually one of the most educated countries in the world. And you do not find anybody there with a degree in interpretive dance or underwater basket <laughs> weaving. Just, just doesn't happen. I mean, it is engineering. It is doctorate degrees. It is accounting degrees. Communications. I mean, yeah, yeah. Mass communications, marketing. Um, to get an accounting degree in the Philippines and graduate as an accountant, they actually have to pass the Philippine CPA exam. Wow. Um, so when you get a BA that does accounting, those kids are sharp. I mean. Big families too in the Philippines. Oh yeah. And, and you know, having had already lived in Southeast Asia, um, you know, I understood that family concept. And really honestly, you know, we, we try to practice that in our business with our staff and all of our VAs. Um, you know, to be very honest, I will fire a client before I let them be abusive to a VA. Yeah. Um, and the problem is, is that, you know, there's two types of people. There's folks like you who recognize their skill and their ability and you appreciate that and you pay them well and you reward them for doing a great job. Yeah. Above the contract. Yes, absolutely. And then there are the people who think of them as poor, cheap, uneducated labor that lives in the third world. And the sad part is, is just because where they were born dictates how they're treated. Even in Asia, Filipinos are kind of looked down upon. Okay. But in reality, they're probably smarter than the people they're working for. I mean, they will work their tail off. Um, they, there's a lot of times, you know, a parent may live in another country and send money home to support his wife and kids, or, you know, maybe it's the mom as a maid in Saudi Arabia and supports her husband who has a job and takes care of their kids back in the Philippines. Um, it's, it's really, it's amazing what they can pull off. But more importantly, it's amazing the skill set that they have. We have a client in Chicago who does like Airbnb hotels. They buy old buildings, they renovate them, and then then they 
you get a passcode and all this other stuff. Not sure how it all works. Yeah. But they needed That's some popular. Yeah. They needed somebody who could, who had a construction background with a structural engineering degree who had actually worked construction. We found him the guy and he now, they give him blueprints of a building they're going to buy. He will break it up into units and then price out based on their pricing list what it would cost to build each room or each door, um, what it's going to cost to renovate each one of those and then on each floor and then the whole building and we'll give it back to them and usually does it inside of a week and a half, two weeks. That's all he does. Wow. But, you know, they couldn't find anybody for less States. than less yeah. than 300,000 a yeah. year. With those qualifications. With those qualifications to do that job. And, you know, they pay 1,500 bucks a month for him. Right now, out of COVID, there's a huge pull and tug between companies where it's like, <laughs> I want everybody back in the office. Or you have companies that are saying, you know, I want the hybrid work week or completely virtual. Right. You're completely virtual. We are completely virtual. With your staff. What are the benefits of that? And then are there disadvantages of not, because you've had offices, you, your REO yeah. office was, was in-house and then mm -hmm. later morphed between the two, virtual and right. in-house. What are the disadvantages to going fully virtual and not having everybody in the same place? The biggest disadvantage is not being able to walk up to their desk, put their hand, put your hand on their shoulder and have a conversation with somebody. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest problems that we all face since COVID is the lack of inner human or inner, you know, being able to communicate person to person, face to face. Yeah. Um, I get around it. Uh, if I'm speaking with an employee or a staff member or a VA, um, I make them get on Skype with me. Um, I read body language. And that's, that's you know, how I'm going. To, I don't want to talk to you just over the phone. Um, I, my staff meetings are face-to-face -face once a week. My chief operations and officer and I meet face-to-face -face every morning, regardless of what's going on. For about 30 minutes. Um, it's that interpersonal contact that is kind of weird and kind of hard to get over. Um, personally, I'm kind of a touchy feely, give you a hug. You know, I've had staff members on camera crying, and really, you just want to reach through the camera and just go, Here, go ahead and cry on my shoulder, and we'll make this right, and we'll get you taken care of, and we'll take care of your family, or whatever the problem is. You can't do that virtually. Um, you know, the advantages, well, there's always the financial advantage, the fact you don't have to have office space or provide computers and all that other stuff, but it's that interpersonal contact. Are, are there too many brokerages right now that are built on brick and mortar locations that, especially with everything changing and, you know, really every brokerage having to pay something to the settlement and yeah, right. what, you know all these expenses that they now have incurred is, is there a for some of them no way to back out of the brick and mortar or is it inevitable inevitable that they're going to have to reduce that overhead and go more virtual you know that's that's it's an even if it's virtual in state versus yeah versus. um i think probably there's always going to be a place for a brick and mortar office. I don't think that most agents, most agents work out of their car, let's yeah. be honest. Um, I think car the brick, and phone. yeah, I think the, the, uh, the brick and mortar needs to be there so that you have a place that's not Starbucks to meet your client. And I think you're gonna see with the, uh, with the settlement and all, I think you're going to see the level of professionalism go up in our industry. And, and when that happens, you're going to need a place to meet your clients. This whole, you know, we've got a building that's got 300 agents sitting in a bunch of cubicles. I think those days are gone. So reimagining the office space, what would it look like to you? A series of small conference rooms, 
maybe four or five offices for maybe top producers that actually want their own office space. But I don't believe most agents, most agents don't need an office. Um, you know, my experience working in a large brokerage with 300 plus agents in it is you spend a lot more time chit chatting and not being focused on what you're supposed to be doing that day. Um, you, know, you end up at the copy machine and three copies takes 20 minutes because you had to talk to everybody on the way back to your office, right? <laughs> Uh, well, the big thing is having some type of open, whether you call it a bullpen or open right. communal workspace, and that can lend to what you're talking about, where there's more distraction in that central oh, yeah. location of the office yeah. than there is productivity. Exactly. Um, you know, that's what they usually tell you, you know, 10% of all the business or, you know, what is it? 90 per, 90% of the business is done by 10% of the agents. Yeah. Those are the ones that are focused on what they're doing. And that, that'll that exacerbate, you think, after the dust settles here on the Yeah, I think because I think we're going to lose a lot of people in our industry. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got thousands of agents in the city of Houston. 50% 50, uh, 50 of them do zero or one deal a year. Let's get them out of the industry because when they do do a deal, it's a nightmare to work with them. You end up doing both sides of the file because they only do one a year. They have no idea. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to see the rise of large teams, whether they own the brokerage or not, you're going to see large teams become a big deal. Um, you know, things like social media, advertising, these all, that stuff all costs money. And that solo agent, one doesn't have enough time to do it by themselves. So they kind of prioritize, okay, we're going to show houses. I know I need to be doing some social media, some marketing. I need to make these calls, yada, yada, yada. They, they don't have the money where the larger teams have the money to hire a videographer or professional photographer or, you know, whatever they need. Um, so I think you're going to see that kind of become the model. Um, you're going to see the number reduce. You're going to see those team leads that are, that run those big teams, you're going to see them being held more responsible for the actions of their agents. But having so much experience, you do see a place for real estate agents. Oh yeah. And, and what is it going to look like over the next 10 years? What, what do you think? But, for you know, the, obviously you for know, the, solo you agent? the professionalism is going to level up, but yeah. overall, what's the industry look like for those that are still living in fear right now that haven't embraced an agent of change mindset? Where do you see the next 10 years going? What would you share with everyone where it's like, hey, you know, I see it playing out like this. The way I see it playing out is number one, you know, first off, the real estate industry, the average real estate agent is well over the age of 50. So you're going, and let me just tell you, being over 50. Oh, I had you at 48, 49. Uh huh, yeah. <laughs> Right, with this white beard and a cigar in one hand? Really? <laughs> Come on. Um, no, uh, I'm 58. And, you know, technology moves so quickly that even though I am in a very technical side of the industry, it's already passed me by. Um, and, and honestly, at 58, I'm not in a position, nor do I want to be in a position where I have to go learn it. I'll hire somebody to do it. Um, which is where I see agents in, in my age category going. My average client is probably in their mid, mid to late thirties, early forties, um, solo agents that understand they have to do all this stuff and they just don't have the time. Um, we're almost split 50, 50 down the middle between really large teams and solo agents. Okay. Um, it's, it almost almost perfectly. Yeah. Um, that's starting to shift a little bit more towards large teams. Um, and I, and I figure it's probably going to shift that way more, but for that solo agent, they've got to find a way to be productive, still provide the service that everybody's expecting because every time something new comes out, the big teams can jump on it, invest the money in it, hire somebody that knows it to do it. And the solo agent really doesn't have that advantage. So that that's where I see them being able to hire 
a 26 year old virtual assistant with a degree in mass communications to come in and run their videography, you know, edit their video, um, post all of their stuff to social media. Um, I think that's really going to be the big, the big turn, um, you know, between the, the declining numbers, the level of sophistication that's coming to our industry. Um, it's important that, you know, they get that help. Otherwise, if they don't compete, they're not going to be in the game. You're friends with, or you're, you know, through the industry, Bob Hale, right? <laughs> yeah, I know Bob really well. You do. I and mean, he runs one of the biggest associations has for years, Houston Association of Realtors. Yep. Um, going from NAR to some of those bigger associations under mm -hmm. the umbrella, like Houston Association, what role are they going to have in the future? I have no idea. Um, you know, I was there, I was actually coming back from NAR legislative when one of the suits came down and Bob was named in it. We were on the same flight. We were talking about it. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, you know, you've got large brokerages that are telling their agents, you no longer have to be a member of NAR. And, you know, that's not good. What does that do? Well, that's, I mean, it's almost like if you don't have the MLS, we're back to the very first days when I started in real estate in little tiny Bakersfield, California, where you had the little paper that came out once a week with everybody's listing in it, and you had to call and see if it was even still available. That doesn't work. No, uh, I think MLSs have yeah, I think the power a, over the associations. Would you agree with that? I would think so, yeah. Um, and I think that's going to be the driving force behind the association is going to be that MLS. Um, traveling all over the country, I'm really surprised at uh, the number of agents that I talk to that tell me that their local MLS is not available publicly for the general public to look at properties on. And I'm like, really? Why not? I mean, where do they go to find the information? Oh, they have to call us. Yeah. I'm, I'd be on listing appointments and um, before our MLS in Connecticut, you couldn't give them you know, a look behind. I would yeah. actually just, hey, I know everybody's brought a CMA over. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just open up the MLS? I'm gonna put my password in and you and I, you as the seller, me as the agent, can go through this together. We can just yeah. go through the comps, we can flip through photos in real time. Yeah. And they would love it. You'd turn that screen, they'd move their chair closer. Now you're, you're creating some level of rapport, yeah. you know, sitting right by them and going, through the MLS with them and looking at properties in real time and saying, do you, have you been in this house? How do you think it compares? You know, yeah. what do you think of the position? What do you think of this one versus yours? Yeah. Where do you see the differences? And they would oftentimes, especially in 12, 13, 14, when price was such a struggle for, because oh, yeah. inventory was so high, it was such a struggle for sellers to wrap their mind around because they had paid an elevated price right. during the boom where they would actually come up with a more realistic number and you didn't have to be the bad guy. Oh yeah. But you gave them the access, the tools to be able to do that. Well, and, and when you, and when you did that, it made that conversation about, I need everything off the kitchen counters. I need them spotless. I need the carpet cleaned. I need this bedroom painted. Lime green is a great color for you, but it doesn't sell houses it made that conversation a lot easier because they could literally look inside everybody else's house and go, does anybody else have a lime green bedroom? Nope. Well, we probably need to paint this. Yeah. And so, yeah, that part of it, you know, I can remember when we got our first laptops and we were showing properties on a laptop and, you know, it was just, yeah, you, they would literally crowd in beside you you know, one on each side of me, and you're sitting here typing like this, and I'm like, okay, Bob and Mary, I think we're friends now. It was your first laptop a ThinkPad? Tell me, tell me it was not a ThinkPad. It was pad. not a all ThinkPad. Right. <laughs> I was a Dell guy. All right, all right. A lot of people don't, don't want to get rid of that ThinkPad, even, even today. Even today, yep. Going forward here, mm -hmm. right now the market's in, a not, you know, prices are, we're still seeing data that, we're hitting record prices because it's lagging data. It's two, two, three months out. Right. Case Shiller's three months out. There's P 
people online who want to believe we're going to be coming into a major crash. It's a very small but loud population online. Mm -hmm. And they've been saying this for a decade plus. Mm -hmm. Do you see any similarities with all of your REO experience between now and like 07? Are there any similarities? Are we walking into a market that is about to crash and nobody realizes it? Ooh, that's, that's a... Uh... That's a complicated question. Yeah. I mean, um, transactions so, have crashed. We're projected yep, only yeah. 4 million seasonally adjusted. We're going to hit that this year and mm -hmm. probably next year. We're going to be down at that 25 year floor for a little bit now. That's right. all the projections say. Well, let me put it this way. When you, in 07, when you could walk into Countrywide and get a zero down, zero dock loan. I did that. Countrywide. So did I. I got the last one in Houston. <laughs> I had to close on the house that we lived in by two o'clock because at three o'clock, Countrywide was being shut down. That was, I literally, we were sweating the clock and we weren't sure they were going to fund it. At the last trade show, the last major trade show I was at, there were two different lenders offering zero doc, zero money down. Now, loans. today. Today. And I looked at them and I was stunned. And I was like, didn't we already learn our lesson about this, kids? And the answer didn't seem to be yes. And I was like, holy shit. Well, lenders today say that these 0% products serve a useful, small population of the market. Sure. But as they pop up, you're getting concerned? Well, yeah, because that was the same excuse they used in you know 2005. Oh, well, we're serving this small segregated population that needs some help. Oh, we're trying to make home ownership affordable. Oh, we want everybody to live the American dream. I'm sorry. In this day and age, not everybody gets to live the American dream. Some people really honestly shouldn't buy a house. They can't afford it. People don't realize how much is involved in home ownership. And, you know, I, I've said this before, I've never said it publicly. I'm kind of hesitant to even open my mouth now. But, you know, in the crash in 07 and that whole period, I've always said that we foreclosed on people who signed paperwork and they didn't know what the hell they were signing. I mean, I don't know how many times I've sat through a closing that lasted, you know, 35 minutes and they just signed away, you know, a hundred pieces of paper and they have no idea what any of them said. That was definitely true then. But yeah. Do you think that's happening today? I just sat through one the other day. <laughs> friend of mine's mom was selling her house. I represented her. I'd only do friends and family work nowadays on the real estate side. Yeah. Yeah. They folks came in and this is your disclosure and this is this and this is this and this is this. And 35 minutes later, we walked out. And I'm like, you people have no idea what you just signed. Um, you know, that's, that's the same argument they used and the same logic that they used. And it's all going to boil back down to the same thing that it did when it started. It's all about making money. That's what it is. This time around, I think we're going to foreclose on, and yes, I do believe that there is a foreclosure boom coming. Coming. Yes. Um, how high does that get? How what? Like, how, what, what are we talking for numbers? I have no idea. There are so many people that are upside down. And don't know it? That don't know it, don't realize it. And if prices fall, you know, we're seeing record, record high pricing. We don't have any inventory. But if people stop buying houses, you know, instead we're going to put in a pool, we're going to refinance, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Which we're going we to stay are here, seeing. right? Um, if that happens, then you're going to start seeing less and less buyers. Properties are going to stay on the market longer. I mean, early innings right now, I'm seeing that already. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then people get in trouble. You know, if we have a downturn in the economy and we have, start seeing large layoffs, then they start getting behind on house payments. And then all of a sudden, 
you know, on the first Tuesday of every month here in the state of Texas, we have foreclosure day. We, you can only foreclose in Texas one day a month. All foreclosures happen on the first Tuesday. And as I used to tell people in the, in the, in the old days, if you see me walking up your driveway on a Thursday morning, it's probably going to be a really shitty day. Um, and I'm afraid that's this time around, we're going to foreclose significantly larger homes. Um, you know, higher price homes. 120, 130 was the average during the REO boom or the bust here in the Texas market. I think this time around, you're going to see a significantly higher price point. Fours and fives. Yeah, because there's a lot of there's a lot of folks that when I was selling real estate, they would come into my office and they and you know it'd be like husband and wife both college educated, small little person on the floor, one in the oven. He drives a sports car, BMW. She drives an SUV, and they want a 4,100 square foot house at half a million dollars. And I would ask them, why? Why do you think you need that? You know, she's gonna quit work after the second kid and it's going, he's going to be the sole provider kind of scenario, right? And I would ask him, why do you think you need that? And he would say, well, that's what I grew up with. That's what my parents have. And I would say, your parents took themselves 30 years to get to the half a million dollar house. They started with a $100,000 house, sold it, made a little money, bought a $200,000 house, yada, yada, yada. And that's what you grew up in. And that's what you think home ownership is. It's not. Home ownership is starting small. First thing I ever bought was an $89,000 condo. I now live on a piece of property that's valued over a million that I paid 263 for because I've lived there for 18 years and my neighborhood has grown up around us. But those people that have moved into my neighborhood, they've torn down, I live in the historic district in Houston, it's called Houston Heights. Um, they've torn down all the old 1910, 1920 bungalows. They put them 18 inches apart, they're three-story garage mahals or what I call them. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, these kids are paying, these 30 and 40 year olds are paying eight, nine hundred thousand dollars for this. They've got a backyard that's as wide as you and I are apart. Um, and it's like, and you know, they've got a great interest rate on it, but all of a sudden we're now having kids. Well, I'm just gonna say it straight out. Houston Independent School District is probably not where you want your kids to go most of the time. And so they move to the suburbs where the education level or the schools are better. Now you've got a $900,000 house with no backyard that nobody wants. That's a big nut every month. Mm. And you know whether you refinanced it when the interest rates dropped or not, if you've got two house payments and you're coming from a $900,000 house and you're moving into a $700,000 house out in the burbs, that's still a big nut to crack. Especially at the rates. Yeah, and now you add in the interest rate today which I find really funny because I'm old enough to remember when interest rates were like 15, 16, 17 in, two, well, in Lance, 1985, 1987. Lance Lambert from Resi Club just did an analysis that today's seven feels, or how did he put it? It's calculated to be equal to a 17% rate back then with yeah. where affordability and everything is. Right. It's like uh, the statistic I heard the other day and if you had a hundred dollars, if I gave you a hundred dollar bill in 1972, how much would it be worth today? Do you have any idea? 30 bucks. 11. 11. It's worth $11 today. So, you know, you apply that to what we're talking about and you know, a dollar doesn't go that far. Um, and you know, people go, it's a $900,000 house. Okay. But have salaries kept up with that kind of a number? No, not really. Well, the one thing I heard in, in this discussion around is, is 08 coming is watch the labor market. Mm -hmm. I think really that's, is that the key? If the labor market breaks, then you will see 
foreclosure shoot up. If it doesn't break, if labor stays strong, unemployment stays low, then if unemployment stays low, do you get to a place where you have a lot of foreclosures? Well, if you look at labor numbers and the number of people that we've got employed, and you start looking at how many they really don't count, and you look at how many of them actually get a paycheck from the United States government, and you start calculating all that other stuff in there, that number becomes a lot bigger than what you think it is. Um, the flip side of that is, yes, if labor falters or we start having giant layoffs, you will see it happen. Um, in the last, well, since the beginning of the year, I've had five different clients call me and ask me if I would open my REO brokerage up because they had inventory in Houston that they needed to move. And honestly, I gave it a long, hard thought, talked to my wife about it, and decided that honestly, I'm getting too old to kick indoors and carry a gun every day. <laughs> so yeah, we're not, we're not going to be doing, we're not going to play. But on the flip side, if you're cash heavy, it's gonna be a great time to buy. So it'll, it, it ultimately, the foreclosure market is kind of what levels out the, the pricing across the board. Should, should agents be thinking, and maybe you, you could be somebody who pioneers education around this, should agents be thinking right now, how do I get into REO accounts? How do I start to educate myself around you know, running an REO account, being ready for a potential increase in foreclosures. Is there an opportunity for agents if there is this the, type of downturn? Yeah, there there is a conference here called Five Star. Um, I it's usually I think it's held in the spring, um, and typically most of the our large asset disposition companies will be there. Um, it's an opportunity for them to get in front of them. The one thing that most agents don't realize is that REO is a pay to play game. So they're going to tell you that you have to have all this education and you have to take their classes and you have to get their XYZ certification, whether it's Freddie or the VA or Fannie or Wells Fargo or whoever. Um, that's the banks making money on REO brokers. And then there's no guarantee that you're gonna get inventory. Um, it's much easier to get inventory if you get an account. Um, what I will tell you is, you know, after you know, 2012, 2013, where everybody had become an REO broker, um, looking at the industry back from that point of view, if I was going to go play in it again this time around, I would bill myself as an REO sales specialist not the listing broker. The listing broker is getting phone calls at 3 a.m. because somebody set the house on fire or it's been broken into. You're on the road all the time, yada, yada, yada. You take it from the buy side. I would take it from the buy side. Wow. And the reason is, is REO brokers have so much work to do that if you already understand how to do their contracts, you understand the process and the flow that they have to go through, if you can learn that, then all of a sudden you will find, and I'm not gonna say I personally have ever done this, wink, wink, nod, nod, um, but you will find that if you have a great house and you need to move it, you may send an email to a certain group of agents who are easy to work with, who understand the process, who, you know, have control of their clients and go, hey, you may want to drive your folks by this house. I'm not saying I've ever done that. That would be highly unethical. But, <laughs> you know, when you're moving that kind of inventory and, you know. So this, this level of agent communication, agents being able to articulate not only to the market, to the consumer, what their value is, but to each other mm -hmm. becomes, it becomes really important after August 17th obviously, mm -hmm. uh, in a world where you don't have buyer comp living on the MLS, but it also becomes important in an REO world if you can articulate, you know this side of the business, you can work the deal. Um, if there's any opportunities, 
give me a heads up. Yeah. yeah. If something comes down the line, you think that I, you think I might have a client that would be, this would be good for, just let me know. So on the buy, the specialists on the buy side are going to win post August 17th. Yes. And they're going to be able to protect their value. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because they're going to, they're going to see inventory probably before the average agent before it hits MLS. Um, so they'll have an inside track on it. Good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, that's just the world. Um, if I have a choice, you know, I've got 10 contracts lined up and they're all for the exact same price. Which one do I want to do? Do I want to do the one that's easy that the guy is going to do all of his paperwork and I'm not going to have to do his? Or do I going to do this one deal over here where I've got to hold the kid's hand for the next 45 days and he has no control of his client and the world is just going to be a shit storm. Yeah. We're going to pick option A every time. And an REO listing broker has the authority to pick that or does it still yeah, go to it's, the... To it's the, actually picked by... The bank? It's actually picked by the asset manager who's responsible for that account. Yeah. That's the way I've always understood it. But, but if the REO broker has a good relationship with their asset manager. Um, it was not uncommon before 07 that my asset manager and I would sit down and I'd say, look, here's your offers. You've got four of them. This guy knows what the hell he's doing. He's offering $1,500 less than this other property over here, but this one's gonna close in 30 days. And this one, I can't guarantee you they're gonna get to the finish line. And they would take that one because just like real estate agents, asset managers work on a bonus system and a paycheck. They don't get paid if it doesn't close. And then they've got a quota they have to hit each month, you know, to take care of my asset managers. There may have been, there may have been times where I kept a pocket, a pocket deal waiting and call them and say, Hey, how close are you to your numbers? If I can get one more, I'll get the bonus. Oh, hey, magically pull one out of your pocket. Here's one more deal for you. There's a lot of this, uh, the experience of the REO running an account mm -hmm. that can be correlated to today. It might be a big Zillow Flex team having to answer to uh, mm -hmm. a growth advisor at Zillow who has a quota with all their teams, right? a monthly quota. Mm -hmm. You're seeing that become common on these bigger accounts in yep. real estate where it comes down to a monthly quarterly number especially as you have public companies involved sure. as well and and, and agents, they learned it from the reo world they learned it there yeah and agents don't typically think that way where there's numbers to be hit on a 30-day 90-day basis right um is that good or bad for the industry or is it just the way it's, it's going to be it's just going to be the way it is um, you know, let me put it this way. If, if I can help you reach your, your bonus number this month, then next month, would you maybe kick an extra one or two properties to me that I might not usually get? Absolutely. You will. If I have a strong relationship with you, would, would you, be, would you look at me more favorably than somebody that's brand new in the industry? Absolutely you will. Because you want the experience, you know what you're going to expect, you know what you're going to get. Where I have problems in the REO world was when asset managers would say things like, you know, you could probably get a million dollars worth of property from us this year if I had a 72 inch flat screen TV show up at my house. <laughs> oh boy. Oh now, yeah. Now we're getting into uh, well, highly I, unethical. Highly unethical. And I personally would never do that. Never did that. I would actually call their boss and let them know what was just said to me. Yeah. Um, because um, I may be an REO broker and REO brokers have a bad reputation. Oh, they're unethical. Oh, they'll bend all the rules. Yada, yada, yada. They'll pick the contract they want. No, actually not. We're really well controlled, well regulated. Um, and our opinion counts when it comes to our asset managers. 
But when an asset manager goes a little too far one way or the other, it doesn't matter. It's like, no, I'll rat you out in a heartbeat because this is what I do for a living. So that was always my opinion on it. Are most uh, brokers like that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, we had a program called eBroker House that literally people would call, you didn't present my offer. Oh, as a matter of fact, we did present your offer. Here's exactly when it went in. It went in with these other seven. It was looked at third in line and the asset manager chose that one. Sorry, you can't, you know, that's always the big complaint. Oh, you sat on my offer. No, we didn't. Um, we don't get that. We don't get that luxury. That's done by an asset manager, but I always had proof to show them exactly where it went in because I got tired of putting up with them. So, yeah. Well, Stacy, I appreciate you drove from Houston to come <laughs> here. We're south of, I guess, Dallas. Um, in We're Burleson. south of Fort Worth. South of Fort Worth. Yep. In Burleson. Again, shout out to Wild Cigars for having us. Wild with an E. If you're ever in the area, and you, this is a beautiful, less than three-year-old building, retail center, brick and stone. Uh, Bill, one of the nicest cigar lounges I think you could find in the area for sure. Absolutely. Come check it out if you're in the area. But what do you want to leave everybody with? We'll put a link obviously down below to check out Summit VA. I've been a long-term client uh, yep. since the first year that you launched. I can go on and on about the benefit of VAs I have in the past. Um, whether it's that direction or another direction that you want to leave everybody with as a takeaway walking away from this pod, a lot of agents, a lot of team leaders, uh, what takeaway would you want to leave everybody with? Wow. So probably the biggest takeaway is work with each other. I see so many agents that struggle with communicating. I see so many team leaders that struggle with communicating. The number one complaint I get from virtual assistants is lack of communication from their client. Being an agent, I understand that. Being an REO broker, I understand that. But the more we can communicate together, the more we work together, the better our professionalism is seen as, the better value we present, and we definitely need to present value right now. And the more we're able to do that and be hands-on, warm, fuzzy, touchy, feely, and caring, the better our industry is going to be. Um, I know that sounds like a, a really silly deal, but when 50% of your clients only want to talk to you via text message or, you know, you leave them a voicemail or you send them an email at the end of the day, regardless of what happens in our industry, this will always be a relationship driven, warm, touchy, feely industry. And if you're not going to do that, you probably aren't going to make it in the industry. It's just the way it is. Leveling up the communication. It, it's something that's gone away yep. in this industry. It's a, and it's a team sport. Yep. And I encourage more agents to think about it that way. Even if you are, I really brand my business as a solo agent perspective. That is totally fine. How you brand your business, how you position it. Yep. Uh, it's a hard to do this business alone. It Those is. relationships, obviously, in your own community with other brokers, other agents, uh, but also the team that you're building around you. Exactly. And I think everybody needs some type of a team, even if you're a solo, yep. whether that's a VA or something else. Absolutely. Um, couldn't agree more. The communication has got to go up. Yep, absolutely it does. Stacy Sutter, appreciate you. Impression. I'll see you in Vegas next time we oh, yeah. hang out at Bam Mania. Absolutely. We'll see you at Bam Mania. At BAMX, we listen to what real estate professionals want and need. That's why our platform is filled with sought-after courses, content, and tactical assets for your business. And that's why we launched BAMX in a box with templates and scripts done for you, delivered each Friday. The best part? It's not coming from panel pontificators who bought their followers and don't sell any real estate. It's coming from top agents, team leaders, and content creators in the industry. It's education that actually shows you how to do what you need in today's market. And now it includes editable templates and scripts so you can easily deliver that knowledge to your database. Every day, we continue to add more content into BAMX, into our private Facebook community, content that works, content that our members have exclusive access to daily. Do not wait any longer. 
Use code Byron and join the thousands of agents taking their business to the next level today. Code Byron for 10% off. I'll see you in BAMX. 